Thank you, Tony. Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. It is truly good to gather together in our Father's house. Good to have you with us, Miss Shirley. Regards from Texas. I hope everything is well with you and with your family, and we're just so glad to have you back with us. I want to invite you to join me in our life verse for August from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 13 and verse 11. Let's read these words together. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Again, I just want to say thank you. Your response to the WMU's request for school supplies. <laughs> Am I wrong, Paula? It's been overwhelming. It really has. Just want to thank all of you so much. Um, on behalf of, of the WMU and on behalf of the schools and, of course, the children, uh, I know that all that you have given is going to be put to good use in the upcoming months, weeks, and months ahead. Uh, last, next week, next Sunday, is our last Sunday that we'll be collecting, uh, and we're going to be adding another building on to the side here to house all the stuff that you've brought. No, seriously, it's just, it, it is really incredible, and I, and I can't thank you enough for, for your generosity. I want to remind the deacons that we have, the Fellowship of Deacons, that we have a uh, Zoom meeting at 2 o'clock this afternoon. It's a very important meeting, so please do your best to, uh, to be a part of that. Uh, I'm also very pleased to announce as we slowly work toward resuming our regular activities, uh, the women's Bible study will be starting up once again, meeting here at the church on the first and third Tuesdays of each month, and the lessons will be starting at noon. So there's a little bit of a change. It's going to be um, it's going to be during the day instead of in the evening, and like I said, it'll be the first and third Tuesdays of the month. But there's an exception for August since we already missed the third. Tuesday in August, we're going to have a meeting, the first meeting is going to be this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, um, August 24th, and I, I invite you to check with Katie, uh, and she can give you all the information that you need regarding that study, and I believe they're going to be continuing in their study of the patriarchs, um, who have gotten much older since the last time they met, so, um, Wednesday night, Bible study. Uh, how Happiness Happens, 7 o'clock on Zoom. Of course, you're all welcome to be a part of that. And I also want to remind you that the Nominations Committee still has a few leadership positions open for 2022. And I'm asking you to please be prayerful in your consideration of how you can best use your gifts and talents to serve our church and beyond. There's a sign-up sheet on the table underneath the clock, and we are asking that you sign up for these open positions by September 1st. Let's go ahead and begin our time of worship now with a word of prayer. God of all wisdom, we have gathered here to worship you in spirit and truth, with humility and with gratitude. You shower us with every blessing. All our needs are fulfilled by your grace. We ask you to hear our prayers of thanksgiving and our songs of praise as we lift them to you. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Good morning, y'all. If you could stand as you're able to sing, come now is the time to worship. You'll see the lyrics here on the overhead. as you are to pour your God come one day every tongue will confess you are God one day every knee will bow still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now come 
playing like that, Tony, we're going to have to get underneath this, uh, underneath this platform and reinforce the floor, buddy. Thank you. Wow. I was just trying to get some energy. There you are. You gave us the energy. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. So. I needed that song this morning. I don't know about you, but I sure needed that song this morning. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. You don't need me to tell you that our world is in desperate need of prayer, especially today. We seem to be just lurching from, from one tragedy and, and one challenge to the next. There seems to be no end to the pain, the suffering, and the sickness. So this morning we're going to do something a little bit different with our time of united prayer. I'm asking that all Christians all over the world, I'm praying that Christians all over the world will join us this morning as we pray for peace and healing and unity both here and around the world. I'm going to invite you to join me during an extended time of silent prayer this morning so that we can share to God, we can lift to God our, our private prayers as well as those of our collective hearts. So take a couple of moments now in the silence and just lift your prayers and your praises to your Heavenly Father. Let's go to the Lord together. God of mercy, as wildfires and wars rage, as earthquakes, storms, and flooding rains shake our lands, as sicknesses of the mind, body, and spirit spread seemingly unchecked, as violence, hatred, 
and politics threaten to destroy the fragile fabric of our world. We humbly come before you this day with one plea. Heal us. We ask you to hear us as we pray to receive the same promise that you gave to King Solomon so long ago. For surely a plague threatens to overwhelm us. Your promise to Solomon simply said this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we humbly bow before you this morning, this being the prayer of our hearts. We so desperately need your divine healing in our world, Lord. We pray for the innocents in Afghanistan, for the survivors in Haiti, for our neighbors in North Carolina and Southwest Virginia and other states who are frantically seeking to recover from the recent floodwaters, for those in the Northeast who are facing yet another storm, and for all this day who are grieving the loss of property and of loved ones. We pray also for the leaders of all nations, including our own. And we ask you, Lord God, to remove the scales from their eyes and show them the way to peace and unity and justice, not just for some, but for all mankind. And closer to home, Lord God, we pray for healing and restoration within our church family. Remembering, remembering especially our brothers and sisters who are on our hearts and on our prayer lists. You alone can bring healing. And so we plead with you, Father, this day to strengthen and restore those who are facing health and spiritual challenges today. We pray for a time when all of our family will gather here in your sanctuary so that we can once again be the complete body of Christ with all parts working together in ministry to our community and beyond. Our Lord Jesus Christ comforted his followers with these words, all things are possible for those who believe. This morning we ask, Father, that where there is unbelief, you will shine your light. Where there is despair, you will sow courage. Where there is doubt, we ask you to pour out blessings of hope. And where there is hurt, may forgiveness flow like a mountain stream. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and make us whole once again. Create in us clean hearts and pure spirits, Lord God. Empower us to share your word with all whom we meet. All these things we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, as we lift our hearts and our voices together, praying as he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. If y'all can stand as you're able to sing number 275, I Surrender All, All Verses.
Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender. Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. comes from Ecclesiastes 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word. We gather to praise you and thank you for all the blessings you give us. I pray that you will bless each person listening, whether in church or watching on Facebook or on YouTube. Open our ears, Lord, to hear the message you've placed on Pastor Bill's heart to share. Open our hearts and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, increase our understanding of your word so that we may go stronger in our daily walk with you. Help us to shine for you wherever we go. Give us courage, Lord, to be a blessing to others through our actions and our words. For it is in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen.
What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Lord, we don't need another mountain. There are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last till the end of time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Lord, we don't need another meadow. There are cornfields and wheat fields enough to grow. There are sunbeams and moonbeams enough to shine. Oh, listen, Lord, if you want to know what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for every, 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 everyone. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. What the world needs now. It's love, sweet love. Thank you, guys. See if these words are familiar to you. There is a time for everything. Solomon wrote, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them up, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. For those of us, many of us, who came of age at the beginning of the chaotic decade of the 1960s, these words from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 were a serious call for change. At that time, very few of us knew where the words of the very popular tune, Turn, 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 came from. And many more were, were even, and many more were surprised to learn that this radical new social concept of change was actually almost 3,000 years old. This morning I'd like for us to take a few minutes and study this writing from King Solomon 
who, as we were reminded last week, was considered to be the wisest man on earth. The ancient word Ecclesiastes originally referred to, quote, one who gathered information for dissemination or teaching of others. The more modern English definition would be a preacher or a teacher. I had contemplated simply reading the entire book of Ecclesiastes to you this morning because of the copious amounts of information it contains. But I realized after reading through it again myself this week that none of us, none of us could fully grasp the enormity of this writing in one sitting. So instead what I'd like to do is highlight certain themes and then focus on the impact that this wisdom had on King Solomon who wrote these words. But I do once again want to strongly, strongly encourage you if you haven't had the opportunity lately to do so, please take the time to read and study through the book of Ecclesiastes. I believe as I was this week, you too will be richly, richly blessed as a result of this reading. Now all of you are well aware of my thoughts and feelings about life experiences. I've told you many times before that I believe we can learn from the good experiences and from the not so good experiences in our lives. I believe that we have to learn from all these experiences. Like many of you, I enjoy trying new things, exploring new places. And as I've grown older, I've learned to enjoy studying. <laughs> Wish I had thought about that 60 years ago, but uh, the more I study, the more I learn, and the more I learn, the more I'm able to grow. This, this curiosity streak that is within me has only gotten bigger since I've gotten older. I'd like to say that my sense of curiosity has never failed me or never gotten me into trouble of one sort or another, <laughs> but that would be a lie. I'm the kind of person that would rather say, well, I tried, than to say, nope, not even going to think about it. How many of you have ever gone bungee jumping? Raise your hand. Oh, come on. None of you? Yeah, me neither. No? Okay. I forget the young ones would do that, you know? How about zip lines? How many of you have done a zip line? <gasps> there you go. Thank you, Deborah. Donald. Jeremy? Oh, okay. I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Okay. We'll have to talk. Haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Sometimes I like to share my experiences with other people. I like to share my life lessons so that others will have an opportunity to do likewise. See, if I had known you had done this, Donald, Donald and, and Deborah, if I had known you had done ziplining before, I would have talked to you about it a long time ago. And I would have asked you all the good things about it. Don't tell me the bad things. Sometimes I like to share them so that if it's something you may have thought about, it might encourage you to do whatever it is. Sometimes I like to share them so that, sometimes I like to share my life experiences so that you don't make the same mistakes that I did. As parents and grandparents, we do that a lot with our children and our grandchildren. And every once in a while, they listen. Every once in a while. It's for this latter purpose, for the purpose of sparing people pain and suffering that King Solomon wrote these words. To spare those who would come after him from having to go through and learning the difficult lessons in life that he himself had learned. And the very simple lesson that Solomon learned was this. Life apart from God is meaningless. Life apart from God 
is meaningless. Before we get into what Solomon wrote, let me set the stage for you. We already know from last week's lesson that King Solomon was one of, if not the wisest and most discerning, was one of the most discerning people who had ever lived, thanks to God answering his prayer to receive a discerning heart to govern the people and to distinguish between right and wrong. At the time of this writing, about 935 BC, Solomon was growing old and correctly believed that his death was imminent. He did die at the age of 80 about four years later in 931 BC, shortly after he concluded this writing. I tell you this so that you understand his mindset as he described it in chapter 1 verses 12 through 18. Solomon wrote, I the teacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Solomon was the king over the nation of Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. He wanted to know everything. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen the things, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to this understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So as you've already heard from the verses that Gay read for us this morning, and Gay, thank you for the reading and for that beautiful prayer. What you've already heard from those words as well as from what I read to you this morning, Solomon's heart was very heavy at the time that he wrote this book. In fact, in much of Ecclesiastes, his writings were filled with pessimism and skepticism. Even though he was the king over the great nation of Israel, even though he was the son of the great King David, Solomon still expressed his inner feelings with these words in verse 1. Meaningless. Meaningless. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. This does not sound like the words of a king. This does not sound like the words of a man who has been so incredibly blessed by God. Meaningless. This is a man who had great wealth, great power, everything he could have asked for. Meaningless. In chapter 2, the king wrote, I said to myself, come now. He said to himself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. I'll test, with, I'll test myself with, I'll surround myself with, with things that give me pleasure to see if that's what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects, and we know this about Solomon. We know this as we read through the Bible. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I brought male and female slave. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my home. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. 
I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers, a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Does this sound like a man whose life was meaningless? He went on to say, in all this, in all this, in spite of everything that I had gained, in spite of everything that was given to me, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for my toil. He had every trapping that the world could possibly offer, and yet, as he went on to write, none of it brought him real meaning. Not even wisdom. Not even that gift that he had prayed so hard for, that gift that he had desired that gift that he asked God for and God delivered, not even wisdom. In verses 12 through 14, Solomon wrote these words. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? In other words, what king could follow me and do more than what I have already done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads, while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Listen to what he's saying here. Listen to these words. This is why I'm encouraging you to, to read through this entire book. We've all read, or many of us have read through the book of Proverbs, and many of you can quote particular Proverbs. But guess what? In the middle of Ecclesiastes, in, in I believe it's chapter 9, 10, somewhere in that area, there's a whole nother set of Solomon's Proverbs, most of which have never been read. Because as I said before, this book, this little book of Ecclesiastes, is one of, the few, is one of the books that is rarely, rarely read by scholars. The wise have eyes in their heads while a fool walks in the darkness, but I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. And then in the final verses of this chapter, Solomon went on to write that even work, even work was meaningless. In fact, in the closing nine verses, he wrote the word meaningless five times. Including the final line in which he repeated what he had said earlier, this too is meaningless, like chasing after the wind. How many of you have heard that expression before, chasing after the wind? You've all heard that before. We chase after the wind in what? In, in hopes of catching the wind. And, and what does it do? What good does it do? It's meaningless. It's meaningless. That's where that expression comes from. It's not new. It's over 3,000 years old. That's the beauty of the Proverbs. As old as they are, they are still powerful and meaningful, meaningful in our lives today. Move on now into, into chapters 3 through 5, and, and you, you, you see the, the tenor of Solomon's writing change. You see the, 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 just the sense and the feeling of it begins to change as Solomon shares some general observations about his life and life in general, including those verses that I read this morning about the seasons and the changing of the seasons. In these chapters, Solomon makes it clear that God has a divine purpose, a reason for everything that he does. In these verses, Solomon helps us to realize and remember that our God is a God of order. Go back to Genesis. 
Read through the book of Genesis. Look how everything came into being. It was all in an orderly way. Our God is a God of order. Even in the midst of what seems to be a very disturbed and chaotic world. And then you get to chapter 6. And I'm laying this all out for y'all, but I want you to read it. Have I said that? Okay. Starting in chapter 6, we once again see a change in the king's writings. As Solomon begins to give counsel and advice to all people, the people he begins to remind them of what God has done and has planned for his creation. He begins chapter 6 with these words. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy these things. And instead, strangers enjoy them. This is meaningless. A grievous evil. So as I studied these words and as I got to thinking about these words and, and I was trying to figure out exactly what Solomon was getting, trying to get across to us today and what I came up with was this, or what I came up with was this, a modern day example. Think about, for those of you that are still working and for those of you that are now fortunate enough to be retired, think about how much time, effort, uh, time and effort right there <laughs> you put into your work you put into your career your job think about it for just a minute most if not all of you worked at least a 40 hour work week doesn't leave a lot of extra time does it no. And most of you, even if you didn't work a 40-hour work week, whatever you did work, when you came home, what'd you do? Oh, you needed at least a couple hours each day just to kind of decompress. Or, or let's go to the beginning of the day. Did you jump up and go to work right away? No. It took time to get to work. It took time to get there. It took time to get ready to get there. And you spend a lot of energy and a lot of time doing that. What Solomon was saying is simply this. With all of the effort that people expend to work to improve their physical life and to surround themselves with nice things, what if we were to take that same energy and that same time and put it into our spiritual lives and growing in our spiritual lives. Remember what I said last week, it doesn't matter who dies with the most toys because we're all going to die. I really got stuck on chapter 6. I really did. I really did. Because I think of how many people we have in our in our world right now that have no, no spiritual relationship. No spiritual relationship with God, capital G, or even God's, little g. None. You ask people about their faith nowadays and there's an awful lot of people who haven't got a clue what you're talking about. They have great jobs, they surround themselves with all sorts of material things, but they have no spiritual connection to one another or to their creator. I really got stuck on chapter 6. In chapter 7 through, oh here it is, chapter 7 through 11, Solomon continues to share more wisdom and many more proverbs. He also continued to write about the importance of our building of our own relationship with God. Now I told you I wasn't going to read the whole book to you, which I could have done by the way. I could speed read my way through it. And so can you. You can, you can read the entire 12 chapters in probably 30 minutes or less. But what good is that? 
What have you done? It's meaningless. It's meaningless if you just read the words. But if you take the time to study it, and, and I hope just by me giving you kind of an outline of these different chapters that, that maybe it'll pique your interest and increase your desire to read the rest of the book and study the rest of the book for yourself. But before I close, I want to show you how cathartic and cleansing, because that's exactly what this was. This was Solomon preparing to die. And saying, I want to share all of the good things in my life. And I want to share all of the hurtful things in my life. And I want to share them with all of you. Because this is what Solomon was like. This is the kind of man he was like. Yes, he was the king. Yes, he had great power. But he also had, he had God's heart. He had a God-filled heart. And so his last desire was to share all that he could with everyone. It was cathartic for him. It was a way of emptying himself, a way of cleansing himself. It was a way of self-examination. We've talked about self-examination. I, I know you're tired of me talking about it, but it's important. It's important that we do that each and every day. How many of you get up in the morning and look in the mirror? Come on, you know you all do. All of you do. I try not to. You get up and you look in the mirror, and what do you see? You see the same thing you saw yesterday. Or pretty close to the same thing you saw yesterday. Hasn't changed, has it? Hasn't changed. But if you look inside... If you look inside today, and you look inside tomorrow, is there going to be a change? Is there going to be something different? Is there going to be growth? Self-examination is scary. But it's so critical. There's the, the, the church up the street here on Hall Street. Um, and I got to find out who their sign person is because they, they have some, they, for years they've had some really great signs. Their sign today, or the sign right now, that says something to the, to the effect of you can't change what's happened in your life up until now. And, and I'm really doing a poor job of paraphrasing it. You can't change what's happened in your life up to now but you can start with today and change the ending. And that's what Solomon was trying to tell us. That maybe you're not, maybe your relationship with the Lord right now is not what it should be. It's not what you want it to be. But it's not too late to change it. I believe every one of us needs to go through our lives, needs to look at ourselves in this same way that Solomon did when he wrote this book. We need to understand where we are in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And, and let, me, let, me, let me give you this. Remember the words that Gay read right in the beginning? Meaningless. The very first words he wrote. Meaningless. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's where he was. That's where his mind was. That's where his heart was. But listen to his, if you will, his final answer. Chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Now that all has been heard, now that I've said everything that's on my heart, now I've, as I've reflected back on my life and I've seen the good and I've seen the bad, here is the conclusion of the matter. Here's his final answer. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. 
Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or it is evil. From meaningless to, here's the answer, in 12 short chapters. Beloved, one day each one of us, each and every one of us will stand before God. Whether we're a believer or a non-believer, each and every one of us will stand before God and we will be judged for what we have done and how we have lived in this life. Believers and non-believers. We will all stand before God and be judged. In this book, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon teaches us that, what we can, that we cannot use what we believe to be either inconsistencies or unfairness in this life as excuses for not obeying God's commandments. We can't do it. I mean, we can, but it's utterly meaningless. Solomon wrote, we need to recognize that our human efforts without God are futile. And that we must put God first in all that we think, all that we say, all that we do, all that we believe. And we must give thanks for each and every gift from God. And lastly, we must understand that in the end, God will judge both the evil and the good as only he has the divine authority to do. Amen. If y'all can stand as you're able to sing number 502, Open My Eyes That I May See All Verses. of truth thou hast for me place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free silently now I wait for thee ready my God
firm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare. Love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his hope, his joy, and his love this day and forevermore. Amen.